We are so glad you're here. Happy Father's Day to all of you out there and those of you in the room. And we're just so, uh, we're so glad to be able to celebrate. And as James said, it, well, some, some relationships with fathers, we understand, have been very complicated. Some have been non-existent. Some have been like God's gift. But, um, you know, there, there's, there's some stuff in all of us that no matter what kind of earthly father we have, um, only the heavenly father can fill some holes. And that's why we're here today, right? I want to give a quick shout out to a father in Clinton, South Carolina, who has inspired his family for the last five months uh, to how to come back from adversity, how to keep fighting, how to scrap. He'll be 90 next month and he continues to fight the good fight i know personally because that's my father so happy father's day to you up there and to all of you fathers hey if you're watching out there wherever you may be uh love to have you engage with our monitor or click off at the end and click back on and let us know who you are we feel like that uh, we love to have folks watching every week uh but it's better if we hear from you and you let us know who you are because then there's another level of relationship. We can, we can engage, and you become then a little bit tighter community, and we can help you in some other ways to administer to you personally. So let us know who you are and how we can help you out there today also. You know, uh, there's some folks, that, and some of you are those folks, that you're, fair, you're pretty spiritually mature by the way we define it here on this earth. But there's this myth, I think, that we all settle into the longer we're Christ followers, and that is, you know, the more grounded somebody gets in their faith, the more predictable their world ought to be, and the more predictable they operate in that world. That's not true at all. And the greatest example of that is the life of Christ, my goodness. If there was anybody walked this earth that was unpredictable... It's Jesus, and we have one after another indication of that. He's supposed to be the Prince of Peace, but you see him, looks like to me, he's picking fights all over the place. He's the one that says, follow me, follow me. But then when the most influential guy in town walks up and says, I want to be in, I'm in, he rejects him. He's the God who, above all, presents love. He is the God of love and the servant of love, but yet... When some people start crowding in and getting close to him, he's very aloof to them. And then people that want nothing to do with him, he's like spending great quantity of time with them. So if anybody's ever unpredictable, it was him. But isn't that how we operate? Especially in a world that seems to be changing every 12 hours. We come in places like here, or we open up our Bibles, and what we seem to crave is, I want the routine. I want the predictability. I want to know how this is going to turn out. And I don't want the waves. But unfortunately, the authentic Christian life never promises that. Jesus never promised that. And some of the people that he challenges the most are his closest followers. And speaking of, one of them wrote a book we call the Gospel of John. So turn to that in the New Testament, because that's where our content's coming from today. When, when we're seeking that model of predictability, I think there's one question, especially guys, fathers or, or not fathers, but all of us in the room, you need, I need to ask this question in some way every single day, and that's simply this, this question. Is it about him or is it about them? Say that along with me. Go. Is it about him or is it about them? Because we unconsciously make those decisions every day. And here's the seamy bad side of saying, oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christ follower, if we're reversing that order we tend to then put the Lord in a box or in a compartment, and when it's to our advantage, when we're all alone or we're in a place like this where there's a lot of agreement, oh, yeah, man, I'll trot him out there and I'll put him on the front page. But some days when we're not in that environment, it's quite better for us with other people to kind of shove him under wraps. You following me? 
The only thing is, there's no model in the Scripture for that. There's at no time Jesus was ever satisfied with that. And so he does things, says, says things to deliberately provoke. And we're going to see a little bit of that conversation just in three short verses here. Because I think what he drives home to people right up to the time that he leaves this earth and goes back to heaven at the ascension, he's saying, I've operated my life like that, he says. It's about him. And then it's about them. And if that's the right order, hey, fathers, if it's about him, have you noticed? Then when it comes to them, it seems to be a little clear cut, a little bit more simple. It's not pleasant every single day, but it is much better that way than when it's the reverse, right? And so with that, we launch in. What's going on in verse 2? Because context is everything. I mean, chapter 2. Well, in the first 11 verses, we get an indication of the very first public miracle recorded by Jesus. It is the uh, wedding feast of Cana where he turns the water into wine. <clears throat> All of a sudden, it's like, who is this guy? I thought he was from Nazareth. I thought he was a carpenter. And then all the, all the questions start. Where did he find, you know, that was a, just a, a trick. That was legit. There, there's something supernatural about this guy. And so now the debate is on. In verses 18 through 22, right before what we're going to read in a second, uh, he has this discussion where they're walking through Jerusalem, and he says, hey, you see that great building there? It was called Herod's Temple, which was magnificent. He says, you know, I could tear that down and rebuild it in three days. And immediately, people jump him, and they say, what? It took 46 years to build this thing. 46 years. Of course, he's not at all talking about a physical demolition and rebuilding, and this leads into that. And later on, it says the disciples, once he's crucified and resurrected, they get it. Ah, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about his body. And so with that, we launch in, into, into this. So we're going to talk about a vertical relationship, going vertical, because we get so mired up in the horizontal. You know, how do I relate to other people? How do I get people to like me? How do I get people to look at my Instagram? How do I get somebody to hire me? How do, and that goes on and on and on. But the reversal, according to Christ, was, I tell you what, let's start with this. Because God comes to you and me every day, and he says, how are me and you doing? And out of that, I will overflow or not all the other stuff that you need. I know you got needs. I know you got stuff going on. But how are me and you doing? And we'll let that be our, our ranking. So with that, let's jump in there. Verse 23, I'll read first. And that simply, since it's about him first, you need to know Jesus deliberately stirs the pot at times. Look at verse 23. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs that was, he was doing, and they believed in his name. So he's at the Passover. He's moved down to Jerusalem. This is the biggest week on the calendar for every Jew. And he's doing, John calls it miraculous signs. Everywhere else in the, in the New Testament, it's basically called miracles. Why does he refer to a sign and wonder instead of miracles? It's because that John being as close or maybe closer to anybody uh, when Jesus is on this earth to him as, as anybody, he realizes uh, the, there's a bigger purpose behind every miracle, and I'm going to call it a sign because a sign is going to point to the one who did the miracle. You following me? And it's really about the one who did the miracle, not the miracle. And he is known as a God, a man of love. And so every miracle he does is out of compassion and generosity and love in his heart. That's the real message behind his miracles. Now, he had other reasons, too, at times. But John takes a twist because all through the gospel, he says, oh, it, it was a sign. It was signs and wonders. But notice the stage. There's something else going on here. When does he do it? Where does he do it? He does it at the Passover feast week when the city of Jerusalem, some people said, could swell to 600,000 people. It is 
packed and overflowing because it's the biggest week of the year. And in the middle of that stage, this meek and humble servant is willing to come up into the spotlight, onto the stage, and say, let me do a few of these supernatural signs because we need to have a discussion of who I really am. Because when you understand who I really am and who I'm related to, then you will start to understand who you really are. And so there's a lot more going on here. Now to do it, he's got to stir the pot. To do it, he's got to provoke. So he takes that stage, and there's a lot of people that are enthralled, and then there's a lot of people who are not. Jesus was always unpredictable. He even taught in a very, have you noticed? There are times he gets up there and he just preaches. And then the next time he gets up there and he just like tells stories. And then the third time he'll get up there, well, he told stories last time, and it's a Q&A session. And, the, and, and again, there is a purpose behind all of that. It is to keep us off balance because here's the deal. If my belief is only in the visible, then when I walk out there and I'm not being able to see the work of God in me in here, I'm shallow here enough and, and I'm not anchored down and I'm going to fall apart out there. And then guess what? I go right back to like everybody else is who does not have any faith. It's good, Jesus even said this, it's good to believe in me because of what you see, but blessed are those who believe even though they've not ever seen. And in John 4, 48, another audience, he says, why do you, and he uses the phrase, you people. He says, why do you people always require a miracle in order to believe? And that's where this discussion starts, because he's, I know in my life, and some of you could give great testimonies too, he has stirred my pot, and what I have noticed is, it's usually on the days I'm not really in a mood to get stirred. And it might be the same with you. I think that may be exactly why he does it on those days. Boy, he's coasting today. Let's see if we can get him in gear and bang. Some of you in your small group, in your Bible study, are studying Job, right? Man, what a great example. Nothing made sense after a while in Job's life. Now, he's got all kinds of free advice, doesn't he? He's got all kinds of people showing up saying, here's the deal. Here's why that's happened. And none of them were right. And so sometimes we have to struggle. Does, all right, here's the question. Does, does God still stir your pot today? Is he still in that business? Do you believe that this God we worship is still in the supernatural business? I just, I don't know why you're here if you don't. Maybe you came to please your father. But I got to ask, if you don't believe, if you don't believe that God is still supernatural over all the events and over my life and your life, if you let him, why are you here? This isn't about a bunch of metaphors. This isn't like some of the stuff we're reading online where I, here's my take on it. Well, that's great. That's your take. But when the wheels fall off, are you going to hold to that? Is that ideology going to hold water in the storm? Look, there's people for centuries die over this stuff. People don't tend to die over metaphors. It's real. It's got to be real enough in my heart and your heart to where it's like you say, oh, yeah, I, would, I, I really believe I would take a bullet over this. Because it's got to be about him, see. And, and then later it can be about him. So here's one tool, one question you can ask to diagnose yourself on some days. Do, have you fallen into the trap of, what have you done for me lately, God? That's the visual. I'll believe it when I see it. Or, you know, why aren't you blessing me is another one. How come this happening to me? How come it's not going well for me? I'm a good guy here. I'm trying to do your will, Lord. Those are questions to ask when it's like, okay, am I, am I falling into the pattern of expecting everything to be okay and everything to be predictable? Because the world is not, and Jesus never promised that. So here's a question before we move on. 
Would you rather have A, a very predictable God, or would you rather have one that you absolutely know at the end of the best or worst day, I know he loves me and I know he cares? Which would you choose? I think we would choose B. I'll take the ride. I'll pay my fare and I will take the ride if I know you're riding with me. If I know you care and you love me and all of this you see going on, whether I don't like it or not. So the second thing is in the next verse, 24, and that is he's not, Jesus not really impressed with superficial faith. That does not, um, that does not make him do cartwheels in heaven. I used to think that. I'm sorry, I used to think when I was about 29, 30, you know, God must really be grateful for me. I show up almost every week at church. You know, there's a day or two a week I'm reading my Bible for crying out loud. I tithe, I give 10%. He must think, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I've had to repent so many times for so much of my attitude, and, and I probably still do, because it wasn't about him then. It's about them. How do I make sure they still like me? How do they still approve? How do I stay eligible for church softball? That was one, one motivation. So he's not really, okay, let's get around. Let's read verse 24. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. Now, he used the same word and says they believe, but Jesus would not believe in them because he uh, knew all men. When it used the word with Jesus, what it meant was he saw the externals, but what he knew was the internals. See, I only know y'all based on the last thing I saw you do or say. Jesus, in real time, and when it says he knew them all, that was a, a verb tense in the Greek that meant continually, like every day. He's real time. He knows y'all, and he knows me right now. He knows when I was really close to him, but if I'm not today, guess what? I can't fool him. He knows. And so because of that, he knows who to entrust himself to in a deeper way, and he knows who is superficial to the point it's like all that's going to do is skim off the surface and be wasted. And he didn't waste any effort on people. Everything he did was intended out of love, not condemnation, intended to hit the mark and sink in deeply <clears throat> and change, excuse me, change lives. He's out for transformation. He's not out to win an opinion poll, y'all. He's not out to gain followers who are just going to all run away when it gets hard. Oh, no. He's out to build the kingdom of God. And nobody had ever come at people like that before. Because the system that was built was, you come to church, you do the sacrifices, you do the rituals, and guess what? You're a righteous man if you're a Jew. And if you're a Jewish male, you got it made. So automatically, there was a bunch of people that were excluded. It didn't matter what they did. And Jesus never came as a proponent of that system. What he's doing is stirring the pot and trying to get people to realize you have a very superficial, routine, symbolic that is not changing hearts. Then he's able to say, it's really, because if you've, every time he talks just about it, it works its way around to what? The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. You know what the kingdom of God is in just my simple terms? That's the presence of God coming out of there down here on this earth in me and in you. And when you and I are together, whoo, there's the kingdom of God. It, we could be on the baseball field, we could be traveling, we could be anywhere on this earth. And when there's two or more, that's what he said, when there's two or more and we both are beyond the superficial stuff, it's the kingdom of God. And that's what he's after. Because he knows if you're just in the superficial stuff, you walk out there. How many of you have had one of those serious encounters with God? 
you've recommitted, you've resurrendered, or whatever you, the term is you want to use. You've heard from him. He's revealed himself to you. And you say, that's, that's it. Today I am turning, <clears throat> and I'm going to do it your way, and it is significant. How many of you within about 24 hours has been hit right in the face with a bunch of opposition to that? Probably every one of you. So when that happens, not if, but when that happens, what do you got to anchor yourself? What's in here that is beyond the surface level, beyond what you can see? How are you on the days when you're not hearing from him, you're opening the scripture maybe, but it's not really speaking to you, you don't feel it, you know. On those days, you're not feeling it. And it seems like it would be so much easier to put him back in the box and make it about other people on those days. Let's just go along and get along and not stir anybody else. What do you do on those days? What do you grab onto? And that is the indication, that, uh, is my faith real or not? And men, I hate to say this, but we seem to be as good. We seem to be maybe better at talking that verbiage than the ladies and worse at acting it and living it. I don't really know how to analyze that, but I think that's true. Now, I didn't say what happened right before verse 23 through 25, there's another event that I think in the sovereignty of God is actually related. They're not random. He does the wedding feast, and here he's talking about, well, we've got some followers, but some of them are not really in, and I'm, I'm not going to jump in and reward them yet. I've got to continue to survive. But there's something else that happened that I think is very related, and we'll see how it goes. This is another side of Jesus that is opposite from this and most other accounts in the scripture, and we're about to see a depiction of it. Make not my father's house an house of merchandise. What got into him? Was that an impulsive act of, as I was walking by the temple, something suddenly snapped in him? Oh, no. That's premeditated. How you know? Because it says in the John passage that he wound, he made a cord, a whip, out of the temple cords. Can you imagine one of his followers walking up to him? And he's sitting down there like you're braiding hair. He's winding these cords, these rope-type things. He's wind, rolling them up into a solid whip. And they say, uh, what you doing there? And he looks up and he says, I'm making a whip. <laughs> All right. Stay out of his way today, guys. But that's what he does. I do think that that was not a, hey, I lost my cool. I hear this on TV all the time, and it just makes me so, I'm sorry, I'm not responsible. I lost my cool there. But yeah, we can tell you lost your cool. That wasn't that. That's what you call righteous indignation. There's nothing sinful about that, when he did it, how he did it. What's going on? Well, there's the obvious, and it's true, by the way. The obvious explanation is, 
they had fallen into what we would call a very irreverent worship forms, and he spoke out against that in his father's house, and that would be correct. Also, he says, this is den of thieves now, and it's supposed to be a house of prayer. That was correct also, but there is a deeper re- meaning, and I think it's attached to what we're talking about here. That's in, that happened in the outer courtyard. That depiction was pretty accurate. It was an open air. The outer uh, court was also called the court of Gentiles. The inner court, more indoors, only Jews were allowed. And usually only Jewish males were allowed. So who has their church setting, their place of worship, on the outer court there where all that's happening? The Gentiles and a lot of the ladies. That's their church. And the insensitivity of the Jews says, well, you know, it's about us anyway. It's about me and them. They're not chosen people anyway. We got to have our stuff to conduct business so we can go in and get righteous and do our sacrifices. And so it just became convenient for the Jews to sell their stuff and have animals and stuff just messing on the floor and running around and money changing hands for profit in the church of the Gentiles. And he had had enough of that. That, in my opinion, is what he really could not stomach. Because you're talking about a guy here who absolutely saw everyone as equal. It didn't matter race, creed, color, economic background. It didn't matter gender. Everybody was on the same level. And so he made a strong statement there. So how deep is your faith? How probing, how penetrating is your faith in that when you look in the mirror, you see a reflection of the Holy Spirit. Can you look in the mirror as I have to every day and say, yeah, I think today authentically, Lord, it's about you. It's It's about him and not them, or do I reverse it too many days? And fall back into everybody else in the world You realize, don't you, that there are people within this culture that hate this culture, but they're in the middle of it because they have no better solution. And if somebody who really is a Christ follower walks into their life led by love, led by authenticity, they're real, they're real with their struggles, they're real with their pain, but they're also real in saying, he's first in my life, and everybody else is second, but that's how I can love you and care for you. Don't, do you realize how many people are dying for that type of hope? Because everything they've anchored themselves in has fallen apart in the last 16 months, a lot of them. So the third point is simply this. Jesus knows your heart before he reveals his That's why he's kind of being aloof. He knows hearts. He knows my heart. He knows your heart. Verse 25, he did not need man's testimony about man. That's great. That's great because that's called encouragement. We need to do that on the horizontal level. But if our faith, if our religion is based on what you can encourage me with or what I can encourage, y'all realize you probably heard this in premarital counseling a long time ago or, or recently It's a reminder, if you didn't hear it, maybe, nobody completes anybody else on this world. What's that movie? Oh, he completes me. No, he doesn't. He is as broken as the day is long, and so are you. Who are you trying to fool? Oh, he just completes me. There's only one who can complete you. And, hey, y'all, even that ain't going to happen until we get up there. But the goal is to get closer, right? The goal is to keep at least all your pieces in one pile. And, and then we go to heaven like that at least. And then you get married. It's like she got a pile, I got a pile. And some days they roll around and it gets complicated. But if it's about him and not about them... See, he's, he's going to call you. He's going to call you 
only when you're ready to receive it. You may not agree that you're ready. I have not many times. He's called me to do things, and I said, man, I'm not ready for that. I'm not equipped for that. And he's kind of like, then later says, that's the plan. That's the point of all of this. Of course you're not equipped. That's why I gave you the Holy Spirit. But your heart was at least prepared by him enough to hear it and to get it here, whether you took it here or not, that's up to you. But he's going to come to you. He never comes prematurely. You listening? He never comes too early. He never is premature. He is never motivated by anybody else. He is only motivated by his Father. He said that for 33 years here. He's still only motivated what, by what his Father is dictating. And that, y'all, that's good news. That's good news. And so in case they didn't get the picture with that, and they didn't get the picture with the an illustration of the temple going away and coming back in three days, later in John chapter 6, a lot of them did get it because that's when he breaks out his famous speech of, well, if you're going to follow me, you better drink my blood and eat my body. <laughs> And people say, oh, my goodness, now he's into cannibalism. And the back door opens, and there's people like, a, like the ship is on fire. There's people walking out. And then, remember, he turns to his followers, his, the 12. And he says, typical of Jesus, he's stirring the pot. What about y'all? You going to walk out? And this is one time, y'all, you know, Peter gets it right. Peter says, where are we going to go? which was a true statement. In other words, Peter says, I've already left my family. I've already left my career. I've already left my hometown. I've already left my home church. I kind of wish you'd have told me that speech before I did all that. But since I've already committed, you're, you're the only one who has the words of life. And so we know that 11 of those 12, more or less, rode that ride. They paid the money, and they took the ride right up to when we believe 9 of the 12, 10 of the 12 were martyred. So they ended up being a great example. I love it. It's an old movie now. I need to watch it again. Uh, you ever watch that old movie, Cinderella Man? It was actually a true, uh, based on a true uh, guy in the 30s, 20s, and 30s who was a professional boxer, James Braddock. Well, you know, the Depression hits. Just going into that or previous to that, James Braddock's getting a little older. He was getting beat in the ring, and so it was time. He got out. He retired. Well, then the Depression hits. He's got mouse feet. He's got a family and nothing. He couldn't get anything to work out. He couldn't find work. He couldn't pay. He couldn't, and his family is... Just getting wor it's getting worse and worse and worse, and finally, the only out of desperation, James Braddock, uh, the, the 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 guy's based on, decided I'm gonna train. I'm gonna go back into the ring over the objections of his wife and the scoffing and all like that. He goes back into the ring, and my good, he starts whooping and knocking out people much younger than him and much stronger and much quicker than him. He's better as an older guy than he ever was in his physical prime. And it's, everybody said, what happened to, all, to this guy? And, he is, and the key is now he's motivated from a different place. You following me? A fire got lit in him. He was... He was he was boxing in a sport earlier. Now, it's more of a matter of life and death. And in one interview in the movie, they said, um, what are you doing this for? And he said, one word, he said, milk. I got to feed my family. And so it is a matter of life and death. Whew. Wouldn't it be awesome? If our relationship with him was like a matter of life and death. Because it really is. Got one more question for you. What do you think 
the Pharisees and the, the people that he loathed and that ended up just trying to destroy him. What do you think that they hated the most? Did they hate the miracles that he did, or did they hate more uh, the temple cleansing we just saw? Well, that's obvious. Temple cleansing, man, wasn't it? I don't think so. That actually happens again later the week he's crucified. So it's like, well, it's been about three, about two and a half years. I need to go clean up again. He does it again. So they must not have been too awful hot about that. In some ways, it's like maybe that's good because now people see him in a different light and they don't think he's like the Messiah anymore. I think it's the miracles that get them. Because think about it. That alludes to, oh, this guy's actually got some power from somewhere. That means somebody gave him the authority to exercise the power. If that's true and people start believing that, then now they're going to start believing his teaching. And his teaching is contrary to what we are teaching them. And if they start following what he's saying to do, now we're in trouble. Our whole system falls apart. Our sacrificial system of behaving and being a Jew and being a Jewish male and you act like us and you're righteous and all like that. And by the way, we're making a tidy profit over all that. All that falls apart. That's what God... And I'll give you some evidence. In John chapter 11... Jesus walks back into the outskirts of Jerusalem to a tomb, and a guy who's been dead four days walks out of the tomb. You know that story. Lazarus, come forth. Now, that's a pretty good one there, isn't it? Anybody who can do that, I'm like, yeah, there's something to this guy. But on that day, it says the Pharisees met down at the church, and rather than celebrate it, what are they doing? They are scheming how to kill him. That did it. That's one too many miracles right there. So he's looking for those people who are not so mired up into the routine and the predictability and the practice of a religion. What he's after is Christ followers, with the emphasis being on following. So how where does this narrative go from here? If you read chapter three and chapter four, I think it flows now. Because he starts to run into these personal encounters with people that seem to have no affiliation with him and maybe nothing they can do for him. It's not about them because they got no power to help him at all. Matter of fact, they're the enemy. One of, Nicodemus, chapter 3. A guy named Nicodemus, he's a, he's a Pharisee. He's one of the enemy. He comes and legitimately is troubled by this man who he sees he's different. And that's when Jesus gives that famous of all famous quotes, remember? John three sixteen. He says that one-on-one -on -one at night to a Pharisee behind locked doors. This guy certainly is not in the mainstream of what he's throwing down. And then, chapter 4, he goes up north Samaria. Well, that alone is like nobody, no self-respecting Jews is going to go through the Samaria. We hate the Samaritans, and they hate us. What's more, the most sinful woman with the worst reputation in town, middle of the day, in front of everybody, he sits down and starts talking to her. And the whole village almost is transformed by that one encounter, another person way out on the margins. And then there's this royal leader. We think he's probably a Gentile. He's not a Jew. He may have even been a pagan. He rushes up to him in chapter 4 and says, My son is dying. No hope tried everything. I'm desperate. I, I've heard about you. I think you can heal him. I'm going to put my faith invisibly in you. I think you, and he does. He heals him. None of those three people had any business spending time with Jesus. They could not further his movement at that moment. They were as far on the margins as they get, but notice what he did. He brings them to the center. Whew. He takes the most underdog, marginalized people, 
and he brings them right up close and says, this right here, this is how you roll. None of them saw this coming, did they? And when that happens, guess what? It gets too crowded for the self-righteous people who are in the middle. So what's got to happen to them? Let's escort you to the margins. You're no longer on the front row. Guess where you are? You're on the outer courtyard. You can go clean the mess up that I made. And they could not, they could not stomach that. And that's still, y'all, that's still how it works today. But it's got to start in my heart. It's got to start in your heart. And that's where, sadly, too many people of the Christian faith miss it. Can I read a a quote that was done hundreds of years ago from a a theologian by the name of Chesterton? And and, and I think he was talking about how Jesus is always dissatisfied with people that are just kind of coming and going and take it or leave it. He says, if you're really a Christ follower, your courage has to have the strong desire to love taking the form of a readiness to die. You must have in your life a spirit of, uh, you must have in you his life within a spirit of furious indifference to still living. You hear that? You approach your life like it's your last day, and, and your life and your life with Christ is the most valuable thing ever to you, and it will remain that way. But if it means it, I've got this, so what, if it costs me my life? The greatest warriors are those who are prepared to die on the battlefield because they are unafraid. And I think there's an element of that in Christianity, men. So what about you? Where are you? Is it, is it about him or is it about them? It needs to be about him. And here's the best news of all. It can become about him right now. So our, our, our group, Braden and the guys are going to come up, and they're going to lead us in one more. As usual, this is where we invite you to come and celebrate some decisions that need to happen, or we'll see you out in the, uh, under the tent if you'd rather hold it till there. But if, something's, if something has gotten inside and turned over in you, we'll just chalk that up to the Holy Spirit of God, won't we? So why don't you stand let me pray for you. And out there, love for you to click off and click on. Tell us who you are, how we can minister to you and get to know you. Father, um, I, I'm so grateful that everybody is invited to your table. I'm grateful that your gospel is for everybody. Thank you for um, thank you for coming into into our hearts, and thank you for showing us the way and giving us what we need, who we need to be authentic followers. This world sure needs somebody who can walk in with love and with courage to say, "This is the way. Walk in it." May we be those people. Amen.